the time is for the coffee. The coffee is uh, at the end of the room, and uh, 15 minutes we come back. Okay, please sit down. Enjoy the next lectures. Okay, please sit down. Um, first of all, I would like to welcome and thank our guests uh, for your wonderful lectures and coming to, for coming to Israel. Secondly, I'm glad to see here a large number of Romanians, which reminds me with pleasure that I was born in and graduated from Romania. So welcome. And uh, thirdly, thanks the famous uh, Professor Gorman. <laughs> and the second famous <laughs> Professor Wexler, where is he? Okay. Uh, for organizing this very good, very high level meeting. Uh, we know that it is difficult to assess a patient's ventilation when he is uh, after extubation, like a critical, critical ill patient following extubation, and also, also when a patient undergoes sedation, deep sedation for procedure, for the performance of procedures, it is uh, difficult to rely on pulse oximetry, so we have to know how it's doing from the ventilation point of view. And about this, we'll talk our first uh, lecturer, which is uh, Dr. Jenny Freeman, about respiratory volume monitoring in non-intubated patients. Thank you. Well, thank you for this opportunity, Dr. the famous Professor Dr. German. I think so this, everybody to go back to this. We have a code. We have a code, right? Okay. 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 So, at any rate, the, the, the famous professor. We don't have to speak the name. So, at any rate, um, so I, I, I'm, I'm really pleased to be here. I've never, I've also never been to Israel, and look at this as a, a, a wonderful opportunity. Um, I just got here, so I have a little time to uh, understand uh, the, the, the country. I did have quite a few collaborations with folks uh, several years ago, um, uh, and I guess more recently wrote an editorial with Dr. Weissman. But, but I'm, I'm basically an interloper here uh, for many reasons. If I start to talk too fast, wave wildly in the back, because I tend to do that. <laughs> so, but. Um, I am a pediatric cardiac surgeon by training, and uh, the reason that I am here talking about this is that more of my babies died of respiratory issues than cardiac, even though they were had a primary cardiac defect. And I think that that's because uh, really we um, had a, a, we've always had a really good way to measure the heart with EKG blood pressure. And we've never really had a good way in an extubated patient to monitor ventilation. So that's what I want to talk about today. Um, I think this should work, maybe. Maybe uh, this one over here. Okay, here we go. Okay, so just for the record, anybody that can see, what, what I've got a, a monitor here that, that we're going to be talking about, um, and uh, so it is a reality now. But, but we, were, we were talking about the fact that with EKG, uh, what we can do is we can, um, we can diagnose patients, we can monitor them, we can do telemetry. We, cardiac surgery and any of our interventions would not really be possible if we didn't have an EKG diagnostic. So, you know, what do we have for the respiratory system that's similar to that? And, and, and the answer is really not much. So what we've developed is uh, what it, we call an Expiron, but the, it's a respiratory volume monitor. And what it does is it gives you a, um, a real-time measurement of minute ventilation, tidal volume, and respiratory rate. 
what the, if you, in fact, let me just hold this thing up. Maybe. It's not too heavy. Anyway, so the top of this thing, what we, what we show here is um, a 30-second trace of respiration. And, ah, there we go. Thank you. What we show is a 30-second trace of respiration uh, on the top. Uh, what we, we trace, it's, and below that is a trend where you can look at uh, 15 minutes to 12 hours, depending on your circumstance. Uh, aside from that, you can see the, um, the minute ventilations displayed on the screen. And if you touch it, um, what it'll display for the nursing staff is a percent of baseline or a percent of predicted that actually allows somebody to follow a single measurement, like it, or is it a, which gives a uniformity to the measurement. Uh, the colors that we have there are based on physiologic principles. What you see is when it's in the orange area, really that's below 40% predicted minute ventilation for the given patient. And we came up with that because basically with the ARDSnet data in critical care, if your volumes are less than 40%, you wouldn't extubate. So the premise uh, in one of the early Harvard studies was that that is probably a bad thing if you're below 40% of your predicted minute ventilation. Um, I think <laughs> Dr. Feldman can go sit down now. <laughs> Thank you very much. You know. In the U.S., there's a show and there's a, a model called Vanna White, so I think we can, we can start, start calling him Vanna in other circles. At, at any rate, so because we have these measurements now and they're simple to read and simple to interpret, we can now start to use those measurements to um, take care of patients. So basically, the measurements come from an electrode pad set on the chest, one's at the sternal notch, one's at the xiphoid, and one's at the mid-axillary line at the level of the xiphoid, probably around the level of the diaphragm. And by putting that in a uniform position, it's really, it's, it's one of the things that used to drive me crazy about EKG leads is they could be anywhere. You'd find the EKG on the, on the baby's left ear. And so this really helps you put the leads in the right place for a, a good measurement. It, it, uh, for our radiology colleagues, it's radiolucent, uh, which is another problem of usual electrodes. And it's, it lasts for 24 hours till a patient gets a bath in a, in a very convenient way. This is what it looks like in the patient setting. Um, and we talked about this. You can see the trace. And with that, you can look at the normal ventilation, hypoventilation, um, apneic episodes. The trend um, is a really good way to see what the effects are of opioids or the trend as, as a patient may be going into sepsis or what the BiPAP's doing. And then the history, which we didn't show you, but it goes back seven days, and you can capture it that way. If you have a Philips monitor, it can go into the Philips monitor screen and into the central station. If you have other ones, where those are in the works. This is the kind of report you can print if you want to hand it to your pulmonologist instead of just bringing it into the medical record. And basically, once we, once we um, had a, a device that, w w that worked, what we wanted to really look at is clinically relevant accuracy. So, so as, 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 uh, as uh, you know, I kind of come from a pretty academic background, but it's really amazing how um, poor the accuracy is on some things. You, you heard Dr. Feldman about some of these ventilators. We think we're, we're delivering um, um, uh, a given volume, and really it can be significantly off before leak compensation, before the, uh, uh, the compliance compensation. But we were hoping to be within 20% error, but actually the way the device is now, it's about a 7% error against gold standard spirometry for volumes, and it's got about a 2% error for rate, which is really um, uh, better than we were uh, suspecting. Um, we've done that against spirometry, like right spirometers and, um, and uh, a Morgan spirometer. We've also um, done studies against ventilators. We also, over here, which I think is really important, aside from being able to show validity in the laboratory, et cetera, this, is, this shows you that, that in, in, a, in a real clinical situation, this is going to give you good data because the red line is a spirometer and the blue line is the um, expiron that we have developed, and these are the normal breaths. And then this here is when the patient uh, tries to um, breathe against a closed glottis, uh, 
So obstructed breaths don't really fool this technology, which is something we wanted to be sure of early on. Um, same thing with the ventilator. It works with either positive pressure ventilation or uh, spontaneous ventilation with the same accuracy. And really what it provides is, you know, when you've got a patient intubated, you're able to both control and monitor ventilation. But as soon as you're extubated, you can't control it anymore. And losing monitoring at the same time really can lead to problems. Um, in uh, one of the ways that we teach the nursing staff is basically if you put a bag over somebody's head, the first thing that happens is they quit breathing. Their minute ventilation goes down. Then with metabolism, their carbon dioxide goes up, and then eventually their oxygen goes down. And of course, if you're on inspired oxygen, your oxygen goes down much later. Uh, again, when you start measuring um, uh, saturation alone, hypoxia is not the only a problem that occurs when you're not breathing well enough. There's a re CO2 retention and acidosis and organ failure, and there's atelectasis. And so there's, there's other issues with hypoventilation. So the history of respiratory monitoring, and you know, I, I go back into some of this, um, is you know, clinical observation. Uh, since time immemorial, people have been looking at patients, listening to patients, and um, I think we do a less good job of that now than we probably did before because of our, our technology, but that's been um, <coughs> one of the ways to assess a patient's respiratory status. Blood gases only came on board really in the 70s, the 1970s. I was uh, in some of the early days of pulse oximetry because I did a bunch of uh, really cyanotic babies. We did some studies for Nelcor, but that was really only in the 80s. And then we thought that was really going to be the answer to making sure patients were uh, in good shape. Uh, found out they were um, dying anyway. Uh, and so looked at the other end of the equation because you know, with pulse oximetry, we were drawing blood gases less often, and that we were, had less of a control or an understanding of the end title of the uh, carbon dioxide measurements. Now, again, you heard from Dr. Feldman how the end title CO2s, even on the ventilator, don't necessarily correspond well with the uh, real arterial CO2, but it's, it gets even worse in the non intubated patient for a variety of reasons. So that technology, while it's, it's good for intubated adults, it's great for intubated adults, it does less well with children and it does less well uh, with non-intubated patients. So some people have started to go back to the future and say, well, well, let's at least measure respiratory rate continuously. But those devices really don't work all that well, we can go into it. But they also, even if you had a perfect rate re measurement, you would only have about half the picture because volume we're finding is, is really much more uh, important here. We showed you the monitor again, and so um, uh, what this slide is just meant to represent is you can see changes in minute ventilation when your other measurements of end tidal CO2, oxygen, saturation, and respiratory rate are completely normal. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, it really gives you a clue as to the patient uh, uh, status. Um, uh, this also says that on the hospital floor it can feed into a nurse call system. Sorry, I keep going the wrong way. This was an interesting study that Don Matthews did at the University of Vermont, which, where we started out trying to compare this to capnography during um, uh, upper endoscopy. And after the first week, even though it was a research study, the anesthesiologists quit writing down the capnography data because the end tidal CO2 measurements were all over the place. We found that out about halfway into the study and said, where are the measurements? They go, oh, well, that looked a little funny. We didn't write it down. So we said, okay, well, then let's compare our measurements of minute ventilation to the capnography respiratory rate. And then we found that they only had rate measurements 50% of the time. So then we said, well, our respiratory rate is really very good. It's 98% accurate. So what, what information, what important information about um, adequacy of respiration are you missing if you just look at the uh, rate versus the minute ventilation? And I thought we'd have about a, maybe a 20% or an incremental improvement using minute ventilation, but the data was really uh, remarkable. Uh, here, and we've validated again, there's another presentation at ASA with a, a 
patient population on the hospital floor that, that is really very similar. But what we found here was that you actually, if you take a respiratory rate cutoff of six and a minute ventilation cutoff of 40%, so if, you, if your alarm goes off with a respiratory rate of six, you actually miss 80% of the low minute ventilation measurements. Not, not a little, you miss 80%. Most of the low minute ventilation is actually at a rate of 10, 12, 14, 16, 20, 22, with tiny little breaths here. And so this really is, was, was very, um, a, a very uh, a, a dramatic finding um, that, uh, that he came up with. And we've, we've, like I said, validated another model. Um, and this goes to show you that even if you change the respiratory rate that you look at, so say you say a rate of six is too sensitive, say if you take a cutoff of eight and you say below eight breaths a minute, we're gonna consider that a problem, you still miss 70% of the low minute ventilation. So it's really a huge difference. And we're finding both for this and in other circumstances, most of the respiratory depression tends to be volume first. On the flip side, this is a study, actually, we were, we were talking about um, uh, uh, the, uh, our, uh, Jesse uh, Ehrenfeld from Vanderbilt published a study um, in, uh, in ANA that talked about um, parameters of oxygenation. So we kind of leveraged off of that, and we said, okay, in 240 patients at Mass General Hospital in Boston that underwent elective hips and knees, there were 240 patients had 80 um, saturation alarms in the PACU. In the average stay, about two hours or so. There were 80 alarms uh, in 240 patients. We found that 62 of those alarms only went below 90% for one minute readings. And the next, by the next minute they were up, so they were considered completely spurious. We then found there were 18 that lasted, that had low saturation below 90% for two minutes or more, and of those, 11 of them happened at a time when the patient was moving around or eating or doing something that was otherwise um, uh, making the pulse oximeter um, uh, have a, an, a false uh, reading. So we, only, we found that only seven of these patients had uh, both low minute ventilation and, excuse me, and desaturation, and so, um, in those situations, the other very interesting finding was the low minute ventilation preceded the desaturation from uh, a, an average of 16.7 minutes. So, you know, in, in advance of the desat. So that's a very interesting take home point. Number one, it gets rid of the false alarms, and number two, it gives you information sooner. So this is, we'll, we, we're gonna run out of time, but this is again a pulse that has to do with capnography and this is the non-intubated patients, this is the intubated patients. We get used to capnography being very sensitive, but in fact, in the non-intubated patients, there can be a huge range of, of CO2s for only a very, excuse me, a huge range of minute ventilation for only a small change in end tidal CO2. So with that, we can use this monitor in a variety of places, and uh, critical care, PACU, um, in the OR, monitored anesthesia care for transport, uh, procedural sedation, general hospital floor. It hooks into the nurse call system. So it's a, it's a great way to manage patients on the floor that are on opioids. And then of course, surgery centers where you may have less uh, resources available. Um, pretty much more of the same. So in the next few slides, I'm gonna show you some data that looks like this, and it, it just comes off of our monitor and, and is presented in this fashion that got started by the the Harvard guys, and it's kind of perseverated. So basically, what, what again, it's up to 500 patients, um, elective joint replacements at, um, at Mass General. And these patients are usually elderly or frail or um, obese or all of the above. Um, but these are elective procedures. And what we found was that two-thirds of the patients come in here above 80% of predicted minute ventilation based on their body size. So two thirds of the patients come in above 80% predicted. If they get standard doses of opioids by PCA, they're fine. This guy had sleep apnea, but he was just fine. 
this hospital kept those sleep apnea patients for three hours. They could have kicked him out here and, and, and saved the resources. Um, but two-thirds come in above 80%. Standard opioids, they're fine. One-third come in below 80%. They get standard doses of opioids, and they go way down below 40%. And so these patients would uh, likely be better served with either multimodal therapy or a half-dose opioid. Not everybody has to have the same dose of Dilaudid, 0.2 in this case. Um, some people could go out with 0.1 of Dilaudid. Um, the other thing about this guy is he had a CPAP mask, but he had a beard, so they put the CPAP on, but then the nurse went to admit another patient. Nurse comes back, nurse goes away, nurse comes back, nurse goes away. So really his CPAP was not working very well. Um, the other thing is that so the other thing we found unexpectedly at Mass General was that 14% of their patients were going to the floor with low minute ventilation. And this is the group that probably should be monitored better on the floor. This is the group that for sure should have less opioids or multimodal. And this is the group that's at risk. And surprisingly, this was not associated necessarily with sleep apnea or even with obesity. So, you know, an algorithm was performed, uh, was uh, developed there to about if they're below 80%, you put them on a low-dose protocol, et cetera. Um, also, what you can see is these real apneic episodes. But interestingly enough, a lot of people with sleep apnea, and now we can actually quantitate this, may have this 30, you know, 20 second pause, but if they have three two liter breaths, they're fine. So this was a patient that actually had a minute ventilation of around five, and so even though it looks bad and would make an apnea alarm go off, this patient was totally compensated, probably because they had really, um, you know, um, um, hypertrophied, uh, uh, preconditioned respiratory muscles, versus this patient who, you know, comes in and did not have a history of sleep apnea, gets a little bit of narcotics, has these apneic pauses, but then the rescue breaths are only like 300 cc's, so that the total minute ventilation is somewhere between 0.9 and 2. So that patient has a very different um, risk profile. Um, what this allows us to do then is create protocols to individualize care uh, and uh, obviously with the goal of improving safety. Um, this is some early data on the hospital floor. Again, there's very few false alarms. Um, one of the problems with oximetry on the floor is, is it just alarms a lot. But this really, uh, somewhere between 50 and 70% of patients have no alarms overnight the night of surgery. And then this was an observational study, so there was this group over here that had like 20 alarms, and they really probably should have had less uh, narcotics, et cetera. Um, again, um, if you start thinking about the procedural sedation or monitored anesthesia care environments, you can, you can use this to look at adjusting propofol doses or, or opioid doses but you can also use it to both uh, look at the, um, at the efficacy of airway maneuvers, and this was again out of Don Matthews' shop in, uh, and Howard Shapiro's shop in, um, up in the University of Vermont. And, uh, and so, um, you know, here's, here's before the jaw thrust, the, the minute ventilation was, uh, was very low, it was 50% predicted, and then afterwards it went up to 100% predicted here with the chin lift. And you could see, as a teaching tool, it was great, because you could see um, sometimes the uh, residents would be doing these airway maneuvers and basically nothing would be happening, or they were doing it when they didn't need it. Um, again, this is the um, where you look at, uh, this is uh, where the device was collecting data but not being used, and after the propofol, initial propofol, uh, they, they left a drip on pretty heavily. It was a combination of propofol and remifentanil. Um, in the same environment, looking at the monitor, they were able to keep it here in this, um, in this range, uh, with, with these, this zone here, which we call a kind of the safe zone, um, where the patient's asleep enough not to kick the endoscopist or bite the anesthesiologist, but um, uh, not so much that they have respiratory depression. Julie? Yes, sir. So the last bit here is, is the ICU. And after extubation, everybody always takes this little 25% dip before they come back up. Um, and so, um, you know, that's been used in difficult airways, you know, extubated over a bougie, when can I take out the bougie, is the guy doing okay? Um, these are some post-op cardiac patients. This one's particularly interesting because 
in this particular patient, there's a lot of interesting features. Um, you know, here's where it went down a, a, a far. The patient coughed up a mucus plug and got better. But in this place right here, this is very interesting because this was a patient with a diabetic lady, no respiratory history. This is the night of surgery. She had um, 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 a, a blood pressure of 195. It was change of shift. The patient was asleep. The nurse snuck in and gave the patient low pressure twice. But, but the real reality here was um, she had respiratory depression as the primary feature uh, leading to this hypercarbia and the um, um, high blood pressure. But if something would have happened to this lady in the middle of the night as a cardiac surgeon, I would have thought, gee, I hated that uh, LAD anastomosis anyway. Um, I didn't, you know, I, I think this was a coronary then. I would never think it was respiratory. Um, real quick, um, a couple more features. If you've got somebody on BiPAP, you think it's going well and it's reading, um, the BiPAP say it's delivering six liters, it says it's got a leak compensation, it doesn't really uh, very well. We can see the, the minute ventilation drop to three in those cases. Also, somebody speaking a little later on high flow, in this particular patient, they went from, uh, they went on, they were on BiPAP at night and high flow during the day. And so what happened with this patient, as soon as they went on high flow, the minute ventilation went from six, and within uh, two hours, the minute ventilation was 25. Um, eventually went on right here to go up to 40, get reintubated. So instead of having a, you know, this was watching this and seeing it go above a rational threshold here, 300% predicted, um, this would give you a better way to monitor and manage uh, these patients on high flow so you, you could have a real physiologic metric instead of just a time course. Um, I, I want to show you maybe one or two more things and before I get kicked out here. But, you know, you, again, it precedes desaturation. You can see um, the effects of dialysis. This patient had a, had a minute ventilation of 20 because they were working to breathe because they had a, very, uh, a, a, a diffusion gradient. Uh, went on, took off two and a half liters on dialysis, went down to a minute ventilation at 10. And, um, and, and so that's another interesting feature. Uh, with infection, you can monitor the patient remotely. We did an Ebola project with one of the guys at Mass General, Julian Goldman. And um, with that, um, you can use this in a variety of different settings with PCA, um, with uh, high flow, uh, or, or with uh, assessing the efficacy of some of your drugs. So that's basically... Um, the story and happy for if there's a, a minute for questions or else we could do it at the break. I, I have a question uh, related to the capnography uh, for the unintubated patient. This, this device uh, with the prongs and uh, CO2 sensor, yes. which we uh, we try to make it uh, usable in every single situation. You don't have an intubated patient and you sedate a patient or things like this. Uh, you said that uh, uh, there is not a precise uh, measurement. How, non how unprecise is it? Well, so exactly. that's, that's what this shows you. And this, <coughs> basically, this is, this is intubated patients um, um, at the end of surgery. You turn down the, the, the gas, and the, I mean, so that they, they, start, they start retaining, you turn down the ventilator, so they start retaining CO2. So in this particular situation, for a very small um, um, change in minute ventilation from 6 to 5 to 4, there's a big change in entitled CO2. These are awake patients that are breathing between 40 times a minute and, uh, I mean, for, excuse me, a minute ventilation of 40 liters a minute and a minute ventilation of, of four liters a minute. And between that range, there was still only about an eight millimeter change. This was a snorkel with a total, with a nose clip. So it was like an inline endotracheal tube sensor. This got flattened out even a little bit more with the scoop, but, but more than, and certainly that technique, it falls out or the patient pulls it off or it's, 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 it's not, you know, there's various ways you change the flow of the oxygen, so that's how it can be um, um, manipulated. But the other thing in these awake patients, there's really not a lot of sensitivity as well. Mr. Burman, uh, what you have just mentioned is called the Capno stream. Yeah. 
Well, the Kapno stream is very accurate about the frequency, but not accurate about the... The, the CO2. No, about the volume, the volume. The time well, volume okay. effect. You can assess it anyway by the uh, range of the graph, of the, of the tracing. Of the curve. The, yes. If it goes down, it means that okay. the, the patient is underventilating. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Freeman. Very interesting.